questions will be asked to the lecture and will be discussed. Mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meetings. Please do not ask for your microphone to be turned on. Now I will try to introduce Professor Go. He has almost countless publications and numerous awards. He is one of the most prophetic experts in neurosurgery, if not the most prophetic. So I have to shorten it a lot. Let's get started. It is my privilege to present our lecturer, Professor Atul Go. He is professor and head department of neurosurgery, King Edward Memorial Hospital, Medical College, Pareo, Mumbai, India, since 1998 until now. He's chairman, editorial board, Journal Neurosurgery, Spine, 2014-2015, section editor, World Neurosurgery, and editor-in-chief in many other prestigious journals. Professor Goyle is the chairman of Craniovertebral Junction and Spine Society. He wrote the book, Craniovertebral Junction, Pathology, Surgical Techniques, which is published 2011 and the neurosurgery of complex tumors and vascular lesions in 1997. He's ranked as number one in the field of neurosurgery and the neurosciences. In the subdiscipline of skull-based surgery, he is ranked as number one in the world and in neurosurgery surgery, he is ranked as number two in the world in a recent publication from Stanford University. His contributions to neurosciences are countless. If I have to speak for them, I need whole day. His number of publications in PubMed index journals are 720. His hash index in Google score is 57. He has five articles included in highest cited, cited 100 papers published in Neurology India, publication in Neurology India 2016. He has two articles included in the, the 100 most influential publications in cervical spine research, publication in spine 2016. He has two articles in the top 50 most cited articles on craniovertebral junction surgery, publication in Journal of Craniovertebral Junction and Spine 2017. He's ranked two in the most influential publications in odontoid fracture, fractures, World Neurosurgery 2019. He has five articles in top 100 articles published of the subject of Atlanto axial instability, including two in the, in the first five articles, publication World Neurosurgery 20, uh, 2020. He has 150 original and personal surgical techniques published in various international journals. This is my photo with Professor Goyle in Istanbul during the Istanbul Spine Masters, Masters, where I had the privilege to meet him for the first time. Please, Professor Goyle, you can start your screen sharing now. I didn't stop though. Yes, I'm okay. stopping, yes. Okay. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Professor Go. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. And you can hear me, okay? Perfect, yes. So thank you, my dear friends. And uh, needless to say that it is my big honor and great pleasure and absolute privilege to talk to my dear friends in Turkey and in other countries that I can see. And I have to tell you that I like Turkey and Turkish movies. My wife likes very much the Turkish films. And we get in India Turkish translation, Indian translation of Turkish movies, which we enjoy and they are fantastic. So with that background, I want to give you some of my concepts. Some of my concepts on spine surgery, which I think are completely different from conventional. And I have to tell you that all the sentences that I speak are all published. So I'm talking from my published work. 
So if you talk about spine surgery, the issue in spine surgery is compression and the surgical technique is decompression. So decompression is the aim of spine surgeons. So compression is always considered to be a primary problem. Compression is always considered to be a bad problem or a pathological problem. And compression is always considered to be a progressive problem. So if there is an osteophyte, all spine surgeons in the world want if there is a compression in the spinal canal all over the world, they want to remove the lamina or corpectomy and things like that. So I want to take you towards a new spine surgery and I want to take you beyond decompression. And I want my friends in Turkey and in other countries to listen to what I have to say a little bit carefully because it is different. It is not conventional, it is different. And also I have to tell you that whatever I say is I am absolutely convinced about it. And I have no doubt that this is the future of spine surgery. So I am introducing a new concept. Concept is, it is not the compression which is the problem. See, I'm not talking of tumors and other things. I am talking of non-tumorous pathology. I'm saying that instability is the problem and stabilization is the treatment. This is a summary of my lecture. Music of movement. You see, movement is life. Life is movement. If we are moving, we are alive. Then our patient comes, wakes up from anesthesia. If he starts moving, he's all right. If he does not move, he's not all right. So movements are forms the basis of our life. Many of the things which I am going to talk, I have already given one lecture in Turkish society. So I am going to repeat some of these things. So please enjoy because it is different. Now, if you see the human spine, we humans are in standing position. We stand on two legs. No other animal on the planet stands on two legs. And all our muscles are located on our back of the spine, back on the neck and on the spine. There are no muscles in front of the spine. Very thin muscles, longus cola in front of the in body. So there is nothing related to the disc or nothing, no real muscles in relationship to the vertebral bodies. All the muscles are located behind. So you remember this, this is very important. In a bird, the spine is not the problem. The problem are the wings and the shoulders. If there is movement problem in the bird, there will be problem in the shoulders. And flying may be difficult. Similarly, in a horse, the legs, there are four legs and they are all powerful. The spine is powerful, but not like human spine, which is focused on the back of the spine. Atlantoaxial joint is the most mobile joint of the body. Occipitoatlantal joint is the most stable joint of the body. Facets of atlas is the strongest facet of the body. The superior surface of the facet of atlas is very strong. You see the ligaments. The lower surface, the inferior surface, the atlantoaxial surface is round and smooth like no other joint, no other facet in the body. All the other facets in the subaxial spine are oblique, except C1, C2 joint, which is, which is flat. Atlantoaxial joint is the most mobile joint of the body. 
Atlanto axial instability is the most common form of instability of the entire spine. More the mobility, more the possibility of abnormal mobility. So at actual location in my estimation is the most under recognized and under treated clinical entity. So I will discuss about this. I am going to introduce to you a new concept in spinal instability. Standing human position is the issue and vertical instability is the nodal point of genesis of spinal spondylotic disease. So vertical instability. This issue has never been discussed in the literature. Movements are the issue. Weakness of the muscle is the problem. And vertical instability is the consequence. So vertical facetal instability, I want to introduce this subject to you. The other fantastic, revolutionary, absolutely game-changing concept I'm going to introduce to you. I have already talked to Turkish society earlier, but I want to introduce to you again because it is completely revolutionary. I am going to introduce the concept of central or axial atlanto axial instability. This central or axial atlanto axial instability may not be identified on radiology. Like vertical instability, the x rays and CT scan and MRI, there is no instability detected. You do dynamic flexion, extension, all kinds of scan, there will be, it cannot be diagnosed on radiology. Similarly, central instability cannot be diagnosed on radiology. It has to be understood. It has to be completely that concept has to come. So facets are the problem. Fact about facets. Facets. All the muscles of the spine are focused on the facets. There is no muscle on the spine which is focused on the vertebral body or on the disc. Facet is the point of fulcrum of all movements. All the muscles are focused on the facets and when the muscles become weak, the facets bear the brunt of their weakness first. So facets are the problem when the muscles become weak. I'm going to just, you know, because I'm a little bit, I want to talk with my heart and mind to all of you. There are two types of instability. One is acute instability when there is a trauma and there is an instability. And one is chronic instability, long-standing instability. Like degenerative spine, muscles become weak over long time and there are multi-segmental spinal instability. I will talk on subaxial spine later. Let me first talk a little bit on atlantoaxial joint. So atlantoaxial joint weakness or instability can occur acute and can occur chronic. Acute dislocation will present with severe neck pain, stiffness of neck, and neurological deficits. So acute is different. When there is a chronic atlantoaxial instability, chronic, like in Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, platybasia, basilar invagination, the instability is chronic, long-standing. So when atlantoaxial instability is long-standing, there are several natural protect reparative games that nature plays to prevent injury to the neural structures because of the dislocation. So this is chronic atlantoaxial instability is the main issue. Chronic atlantoaxial instability is the father of 
all these problems like Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, external syringomyelia, syringobulbia, short head, short neck, basilar invagination, kyphoscoliosis, kyphoscoliosis, torticollis, bifid, C1, C2, C2, C3 fusion, clipal file, platybasia, and many other problems. So chronic atlantoaxial instability is the father of all these problems. So when you see Chiari malformation, it is due to atlantoaxial instability. When you see syringomyelia, it is due to atlantoaxial instability. When you see Chiari and syringomyelia, it is due to atlantoaxial instability. When you see basilar invagination, it is due to atlantoaxial instability. Basilar invagination may be associated with Chiari and syringomyelia. Basilar invagination may be associated with short head and short neck. Basilar invagination may be associated with kyphoscoliosis. Or basilar invagination may not be associated. So if you see only bifid C1, without any other problem in the spine, it is due to chronic atlantoaxial instability. If you see platybasia without any other problem, it is due to chronic atlantoaxial instability. So when you see Chiari with syringomyelia or without syringomyelia, or Chiari with basilar or without basilar, it is due to atlantoaxial instability and you have to treat atlantoaxial instability. You don't have to treat anything else. So when we talk of pathology, like Chiari, we say pathological. Syringomyelia, we say pathological. So all these things are secondary issues, secondary. They are not primary problems. They are secondary. They are all protective. So you must remember all secondary things which look like pathological are naturally protective. And the third and most important thing is if you do atlantoaxial stabilization, all these things are reversible. So compression, so just listen to my beautiful sentence, compression is always secondary. Com compression is always protective and compression is always reversible. So these three sentences. Now, before I go further, I want to ask my, uh, are you able to understand what I'm saying? Is, is it clear? Yes, sir, perfectly. Okay, thank you. So let us go further. So chronic atlantoaxial instability is the problem. This issue is not discussed in the literature. Nobody has really talked about this problem in the literature. Basilar invagination. You see basilar invagination in the year 2004, we had divided basilar invagination into two groups. One is when the odontoid process goes up and one is when odontoid process, when the tonsil comes down. So in 2004, we had made a division of basilar invagination into two groups. Before that, the basilar invagination was considered to be a fixed at fixed atlantoaxial instability, and only decompression was the treatment. Transoral decompression for this was the treatment, and foramen magnum decompression for this group was the treatment. So in 2004, we said that for this group, atlantoaxial instability, there is a unstable atlantoaxial joint and you can do craniovertebral junction realignment. So instability for the first time in the literature, we said that this is unstable. This is not a fixed anomaly. Compression is not primary. Atlantoaxial instability is the cause and compression is secondary. 
stabilization is the treatment. For this group, we had said foramen magnum decompression is the treatment in 2004. So now you know many of the, like basilar invagination, open the joint, distract the facet, realign the craniovertebral junction. There is no role for decompression, no role for decompression. Stabilization is the trick. And many people who are doing craniovertebral junction in the world are trying to do realignment rather than decompression. So we have got now several hundred, maybe more than maybe more than 2,000 such cases where there is basilar invagination and there is reduction and decompression. So we do not do any kind of decompression. Stabilization is the treatment. So as we progressed, we realized that basilar invagination for both the groups, A and B, instability is the primary issue Basilar invagination is a secondary issue. Basilar invagination is a protective phenomena and basilar invagination is reversible. So stabilization is the treatment. And we said that transoral decompression is completely historical operation. This is what we said in the year 2004. In 1999, we said that basilar invagination is like lumbosacral lysthesis. So we started talking about facets, about facets. So C1 over C2 lysthesis causes basilar invagination. That is what we said for group A basilar invagination. So like this is the case, there is basilar invagination, there is carry, there is syrinx. Basilar invagination is the issue. Lysthesis is the problem. Stabilization is the treatment. There is no need for decompression. So this is what we said in 1999. We said that atlantoaxial instability is primary. Basilar invagination, carry, syrinx are secondary phenomena. Then we introduced about 15 years ago. Now I want you to see very carefully a fantastic concept of central atlantoaxial instability. Central atlantoaxial instability. And you will be surprised that central or axial atlantoaxial instability is not only the cause of basilar invagination, Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, but also cervical spondylosis, degeneration, spinal deformities. Now, I'm not sure how many of you treat OPLL, ossified posterior longitudinal ligament, which is very common in Asian countries, and I'm sure in Turkey also, ossified and Hirayama disease. So central instability may be the primary problem in all these kind of problems. So let me discuss this issue with you. Now carefully see this slide. There is Atlanto dental interval disturbance here. So this was the only parameter to define Atlanto axial instability. So we had said that facetal instability C1 over C2 is the problem. And this is the cause. And there is compression. Lysthesis is the problem. Stabilization is the treatment. So this is type 1. Now carefully see this one. You see type 2. This is basilar invagination. Odontoid process has gone in. There is no compression. There is no atlantodental interval disturbance. No interval disturbance. But carefully see this slide, the C1 is behind C2. So this is type 2 instability. There is no atlantodental interval disturbance. There is no compression. Decompression is not the treatment. It is harmful. It is negative treatment. You have to do atlantoaxial stabilization. And you see a magic clinical outcome, magic, that you have never realized with decompression. Now, another beautiful thing is like presence of Chiari, presence of assimilation of Atlas, presence of Platybasia, presence of Syringomyelia are all 
secondary phenomenon even in the absence of atlantodental interval disturbance, even when the facetal C1, C2 facets are in alignment, this is an unstable atlantoaxial joint and you do stabilization, no decompression. And my dear friends, you will see an absolute clinical magic and also radiological magic the syringomyelia will reduce in 100% of cases. The problem in this situation is to do atlantoaxial fixation is not an easy operation, particularly when there is high basilar invagination, not an easy operation, particularly presence of syringomyelia and chiari, not an easy operation, but it is a magical operation. So basilar invagination is secondary. Basilar invagination and associated things like platybasia, chiari, syrinx, and all are secondary. When basilar invagination is present alone, it is atlantoaxial instability. When chiari is present alone, it is atlantoaxial instability. When syringomyelia is present alone, or with chiari, or with basilar, they are all atlantoaxial instability. So we wrote several articles on this. Group A and group B, both these groups, the treatment is atlantoaxial stabilization. There is no need for decompression. And many people in the world of craniovertebral junction do not do decompression. So there is chiari and syrinx. You have to see the facets. And you, even when there is no atlantodental interval disturbance, even when there is no facetal malalignment, you have to do atlantoaxial fixation and the syrinx will reduce in the, this is immediate post-operative reduction. It means you do after three days, syrinx is reduced. You do after one year in 100% patient, the syringomyelia will reduce in its dimension. So atlantoaxial fixation is the treatment of all kinds of carry. Of course, I'm not talking of tumor and chiari and spina bifida and chiari, I'm not talking of this thing. I'm talking of this kind of chiari, this kind of syringomyelia, atlantoaxial fixation is the treatment. And we have produced several articles on the subject, no atlantodental interval disturbance, little bit here, no decompression, only stabilization. Instability is the problem and stabilization is the treatment. Even when there is no atlantodental interval problem, no facetal malalignment, presence of tonsillar herniation. You see this concept of tight posterior fossa was introduced by us in 1998, that it is tight and you have to do decompression. This concept we had introduced in basilar invagination. But now I'm saying there is no question of tight posterior fossa. Atlantoaxial instability is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. And now we have got several hundred patients where we have done only fixation for carry and syrinx and the syringomyelia has reduced. This is immediate post-op, this is delayed post-op. Syrinx reduced or not reduced is not the issue. Patient will improve like you have never seen in your lifetime. <coughs> Basal invagination, syringomyelia, carry malformation are all secondary to atlantoaxial instability. Atlantoaxial instability is the cause of chiari malformation and atlantoaxial fixation is the treatment. Do not, I suggest my dear friends, do not think that it is hypothetical or maybe, may not be, it is absolute. And if I'm saying on the basis of my experience of more than 400 cases, 450 cases, you have to just believe what I'm saying. So when there is no bone abnormality in the craniovertebral junction, even in those situations, chiari and syringomyelia, you have to do atlantoaxial stabilization. So I wrote this article and I want you to read this article of mine in World Neurosurgery of my experience with 388 cases. And I have said that Chiari should not be called a malformation. It, should, it, it is natural protective and you should call it formation. Similarly, we said, and it is such a big thing. You see, at that time, all everybody used to put shunts in the syringe and decompression and all those things. We said, 
that syrinx is a natural protective phenomenon. It is helpful, it is not harmful. We should not treat syrinx, we should treat the cause of syrinx and we should do atlantoaxial fixation. So these kind of short neck, short, which we see in basilar invagination are all secondary, all protective and all reversible and you see, you can make this kind of twisted neck into straight neck. You can give such beautiful smile to the patient, such beautiful smile to the patient, and you can feel like a king. So all these things are reversible. Musculoskeletal, basilar invagination, platybasia, simulation. Even we have said in my article that we feel, although we have not seen, that even bone fusions can be reversible. So this kind of smile and this kind of neck, in the immediate post-operative, you can give straight neck, long neck, and you can cure the person. And you, these are the patient. Another beautiful thing, when I talk of short head, when I talk of short spine, when, when there is short neck, short neck, there is torticollis. When there is short spine, there is kyphoscoliosis. So now listen to this beautiful thing. In this age group, kyphoscoliosis is almost more than 80% of times due to atlantoaxial instability. You stabilize atlantoaxial joint and this will revert back to normal. There's no need to treat this kyphoscoliosis. You take it from it in more than 80% in this adolescent age group. So there can be central or atlantoaxial instability can by itself be a cause of cervical myelopathy. Like you see this patient, there is syringomyelia. There is no compression at the atlantoaxial joint. There is no atlantodental interval disturbance, no facetal malalignment. When you see bifid, you see this bifid, there is no other problem in the spine. It is a manifestation of atlantoaxial instability. You have to do atlantoaxial stabilization. So can foramen magnum decompression surgery become historical? My answer is absolutely clear, yes. Now I want to take you to another chapter. So my dear friends, you fasten your seat belts because you are seeing going to, I'm going to talk something different, maybe a little bit controversial for you. But I'm saying, and you have to believe because you have invited me to talk, that this is the future. This is an absolute revolution which I'm going to present before you. You see, anterior cervical approaches, this is the chapter I had written for Schuit and Smedek book. I was very commonly, very frequently doing anterior approaches for cervical spine and these kind of corpectomies and partial discoidectomy, I was doing on a regular basis, this anti-osteophyte resection, and this was from my book chapter. Then we had introduced these kind of tricortical screws, tricortical screws and standalone screws we had introduced, and these screws, not very popular, but about 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we had introduced these screws. Now, now listen to this. All the muscles of the spine are focused on the facets. Disc is not the problem. There is no muscle focused on the disc. You have to pray. Disc is God. Disc is divine. Disc is never the problem. Disc is mother. Problem is the weakness of muscles due to disuse or abuse or misuse or lack of exercise and many people call it aging or due to injury or due to injury. So when the muscles become weak, there is problem in the facets and there can be vertical facetal instability. This is the point of genesis of degenerative disease. So first I will talk about degenerative arthritis of craniovertebral junction. If you read the literature and if you think about yourself, whenever we talk of cervical degeneration, we talk of C5, C6, C6, 7, sometimes C4, 5, sometimes rarely C2, 3, never about C1, C2. 
I have to give you one statement that C1, C2 spinal degeneration is the most common and most neglected form of spinal degeneration. So this article I had written in 2010, where we talked about spinal degeneration in craniovertebral junction. Now, my dear friends, I want you to see very carefully this slide. And I will want to spend some time on this slide. You see reduction in the joint space. Can you see the reduction? Yeah. Yes, sir. You see buckling of the posterior longitudinal ligament. You can see this buckling? Yes. Can you see this osteophyte formation? Yes, sir. All these things, reduction in the joint space, buckling of the posterior longitudinal ligament, osteophyte formation is due to vertical instability. They are not primary, they are secondary. You don't have to remove the, this ligament or you don't have to remove this osteophyte. You don't have to increase the space. Problem is instability. You have to stabilize the joint. Problem is vertical spinal instability. This is ossification in the apical ligament. This is some osteophyte formation. This is some osteophyte formation. So there is no need for any kind of decompression. This is not primary. There is no need for decompression from front or from behind. This is secondary. This is protective and this is reversible. So what you have to do is you have to do this is unstable and you have to stabilize. There is no role for any kind of decompression. Now this is retroodontoid pseudotumor. If you read the articles before, you know, 1990, 19. 95, even today, even today, there are some articles where they say, I will do transoral removal of this, transendoscopic removal or lateral removal. We had said for the first time in the literature that this is a secondary, this is compression. This is not primary. This is secondary. This is protective and this is reversible following atlantoaxial stabilization. So retroodontoid pseudotumor is an evidence of craniovertebral junction instability. You do atlantoaxial stabilization and there will be a magical recovery in the patient. And if you do decompression, there may be some recovery here and there, but you are harming the instability. You are exacerbating the instability, which is a negative process. So at, in the year 2004, about 20 years ago, for the first time in the literature, we said that atlantoaxial instability is the cause of retroodontoid mass and atlantoaxial stabilization is the treatment. So many people now in the world are doing stabilization and there are many articles in the literature. Retroodontoid cyst. Many people will come from transoral lateral to remove this cyst. This is compression. This is not primary. This is protective and this is reversible. This can be reversible in the immediate post-operative period. You do stabilization and you see the magic and there will be complete, maybe not immediate post op maybe a after two months or three months, this will certainly disappear. There is no need to touch or no need to do any kind of decompression from front or from behind. Even this cyst, you see when you are seeing such a cyst, but you see the unstable joint. There is platybasia, there is assimilation of atlas. These are all indicators of a highly unstable joint. You stabilize and this disappears spontaneously. So compression, you should and try to understand why this has come and what is the treatment, not just go ahead and do resection. So we have got several cases where we have done only stabilization and the cyst has disappeared. So this is a possible issue. Os odontoidium is a secondary phenomenon. 
os odontoidium is a naturally protective phenomena this i have published in world neurosurgery os odontoidium is associated with this kind of pseudo tumor this kind of protective bone deformation so you do extension this pseudo tumor goes inside and outside and you have to do fixation there is no need to remove this primarily so you see there are several several cases with me and if you are interested you must please read this article of mine which was published in world neurosurgery about my cases of retro odontoid pseudo tumor even panas if you if you realize some of you are senior i'm sure some of you are very senior in the audience this panas rheumatoid panas you see there was transoral surgery to remove this panas was very very frequently done operation transoral decompression now we have said that this kind of buckling of the posterior longitudinal ligament is due to vertical collapse destruction of the facets you have to do stabilization and there is no need to do any kind of primary resection this is not a pathological phenomena this is natural protective secondary issue so in the year 2000 we introduced intra articular spaces many of you in the audience must be knowing and because these are very popular and i know some of you have written some papers also i have seen many of you writing and i know many turkish people many turkish young and senior neurosurgeons and spine surgeons and orthopedic surgeons doing many of these kind of intra articular implants so we had introduced these implants in the year 2004 for the first time in the literature i don't use them too often now but this was my article at that time in 2003 where we had introduced these kind of spaces now i want to talk to you about how i develop myself in degenerative spinal disease now if you see a vertebra cervical vertebra or lumbar vertebra and if you see this bone the facet is the strongest part of the bone vertebral body is not the strongest part even pedicle is not strong the facets are the strongest there is nothing no bone no part of the bone which is stronger than facets but we have never used facets we don't use facets too much in cervical or lumbar stabilization so lysthesis is the problem and lysthesis of the facets of the cervical spine or lumbar spine due to muscle weakness is the first problem that can happen in degenerative spine osteophyte formation disc space reduction ligamentum flavum buckling or posterior longitudinal buckling are all secondary due to primary problem of lysthesis now my dear friends i want you to see properly this slide are you seeing this slide yes sir now you see the same thing which i asked you can you see this joint disc space reduction yes can you see this osteophytes yes sir can you see this disc bulges yes sir can you see this disc bulges yes all these things are not primary they are secondary due to vertical spinal instability due to muscle weakness and lysthesis of the facets they are not primary they are secondary they are protective and they are reversible let me show you so this is not i i want to show you this one so vertical facetal instability is the point of genesis of spinal spondylotic disease this concept we introduced in the literature if you read the literature all the chapters on degenerative spine will say disc space reduction reduction in water content of the disc herniation of the disc are the processes of degeneration but i am saying this is divine this is not or never the problem it is spinal instability 
So we introduced in the year 2010 intra-articular spacers. You can see intra-articular. We distracted the facets and introduced these spaces. So you see there is a bulging disc here. There is no decompression. The disc space has increased. The ligamentum flavum has become straight. The osteophyte has disappeared. So we introduced in 2000, 2010 this concept that you can introduce intra-articular spaces. <clears throat> you see this ligamentum flavum buckling? Yes, sir. <clears throat> can you see? Yes, sir. You see this bulging disc? Perfectly. And so I introduced this intra-articular spaces. You see this bulging disc have gone, the ligament of flavum have become strong and there is disc, there is no compression. And most importantly, the patient will improve dramatically that you have never seen with decompression. If you see the literature, even today, big laminectomy is the gold standard treatment for such problem. I am saying laminectomy is not the treatment Laminectomy is harmful and negative. You see there is a disc bulge and this is post-operative. I have introduced two spacers. The disc has increased in size. So you can introduce multiple spacers at multiple levels. So for the first time in the literature, we said that decompression is not the treatment. Stabilization is the treatment and arthrodesis is the treatment. So we have got several cases from that time when we used to do this operation. And you see there is only arthrodesis, there is no decompression. And arthrodesis and distraction is the treatment. And if you see carefully, you see there is bulging disc, can you see? Yes. You see that has gone and there is no compression. This is immediate post-operative period and ultimate after some time arthrodesis. So we introduced in 2011, this, this was published in Journal of Neurosurgery for the first time in the literature, facetal distraction as the treatment. So this is the treatment and we introduced a new concept of spinal degeneration. And these were my spacers. And we did several studies of anatomy and facetal anatomy. And Hassan had told me to show some videos. So let me show you a brief video on this. You see, this is the facetal articulation. Can you see that? Yes, sir. And you see how unstable it is. And, and you see, I can do this operation in exactly one minute or two minutes, one level fixation. And I'm telling you, it is very, very strong fixation. You see, it is finished in one minute, not two minutes, in one minute and it is absolutely safe and beautiful operation. So I can do multiple levels of this kind of fixation. And it is, you know, you, if you know how difficult it is to do anterior fixation, it is, you know, this anterior exposure, carotid artery, trachea, this is absolutely safe, simple, quick, and very strong. So I will go further from here. So you see here, can you see this bulging here? Can you see? We see the video. No, no, you video is finished ah, now. Okay, can now we see, see the this? slide, can, yes. Can you, can you see the bulge? Yes. yes. You see this immediate post-operative, the bulge is gone. There is multiple spaces here and there is no decompression, only spaces. At that time, we also introduced this, you see, can you see this? Disc herniation. See, for this, when there is ligamentum, posterior longitudinal ligament, the whole world will come and remove the disc. There is no question. So what we did was distracted and the disc is gone in the immediate post-operative period. You see immediate post-operative reversal of disc herniation. I will show you better images after some time. So same concept. Now, can you see, my dear friend, this bulging disc? Yes. Can you see the bulging ligamentum flavum? Yes, sir. So I am saying this are not primary process. This is not, this is due to multi-segmental instability. You introduce this spacer, there is no need for decompression. So this is what we had said. And this is, I had published in Journal of Neurosurgery in the year 2013. So for multiple level lumbar canal stenosis, no decompression, only spacers. 
So now I go further. This was also I used to do. Now what I'm doing, I want to show you. So decompression of compressed and deformed neural system has been the basis of surgical treatment for several decades. So what we do as spine surgeons is we see the compression and we do decompression. This is the basis. In the year 2013, we introduced an absolutely brand new concept that there is no need for even distraction. You do only fixation. Instability is the problem and only fixation is the treatment. And in the year 2020, I published my series of 215 cases. You read the title, this was in World Neurosurgery, Muscle weakness related spinal instability is the cause. Muscle weakness related spinal instability is the cause of spinal degeneration and spinal stabilization is the treatment. No decompression, no osteophyte removal, no corpectomy, no discoidectomy. Now you see carefully, can you see this light? You see the bulges? Can you see? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, you keep on saying yes. Okay. <laughs> see, there is an osteophyte here. Now there are osteophytes here. There is compression here. So I'm saying compression is secondary, compression is primary. You do only fixation, only camelus technique, transarticular fixation. And you see, after one and a half year, you see the whole thing has become normalized. Can you see the difference? There is no, I have not touched the disc. I have not touched the osteophyte. I have not touched the ligamentum flavum. I have not touched the lamina. And the whole spinal system has reversed. Can you see? Yes, sir. Okay. Similarly, you see this one, multi-segmental osteophytes, multi-segmental ligamentum flavum. I have done only transarticular fixation there is no laminectomy, there is no discoidectomy, there is no corpectomy. And you see after about 12 months or 13 months, the whole thing has disappeared and the whole cord has returned to normal. There are some shadows here, but they will go or not, I'm not sure. But the patient will improve remarkably in the immediate post-operative period. I will say not remarkably, but magically a magic that you have never realized in the surgery of degenerative spine. So degenerative cervical myelopathy, we should start looking a little differently. We have done decompression for several decades. Now I will say the era of decompression is finished. I have got several articles. I wish you can read some of these articles. Is the symptom of cervical and lumbar radiculopathy and evidence of spinal instability is focal cord atrophy, a chronic instability. Essentially, instability is the cause of symptoms, not compression. Instability is the cause of symptoms and stabilization is the treatment. It is not neural deformation or compression, but instability is the cause of symptoms in degenerative spinal disease. So you please remember this. And I use this transarticular camelus technique of fixation. And my feeling is these facets are the strongest. These screws are the strongest. And this kind of stabilization we can never achieve by any other kind of stabilization. I have done all kinds of stabilization, pedicular fixation, anterior fixation, midline fixation. This fixation has something unique, something magical, something out of the world. This camelus technique is absolutely wonderful. So I want to quickly show you the video because Hassan told me to show some videos and I got it with difficulty, some of these videos. You see, this is unstable and my associate will open and I do five level fixation or four level fixation in 10 minutes or 15 minutes. This is not, I don't think this is even an edited video. So this was exposed by my associates or some my partner, then what I'm doing is you will see. 
You see, this is a guide in the facet, trans articulates. You see the angles you have to see, read my article, or you can read, you see, <clears throat> I've introduced trans articular. This is a guide hole. And then I introduce a screw. Then this is a tap. And you imagine if I'm doing five level fixation or four level fixation in 15 minutes, how much time you will take to do anterior fixation four levels? <clears throat> you do corpectomy, this degen decompression, and you must realize that I am doing fixation without any form of decompression. No laminectomy, no discoidectomy, no corpectomy. And I have to tell you, my dear friends, I was doing these things for several years. But believe me, this transarticular fixation has something magical. It stabilizes such beautifully, such quickly, and such powerfully. These facets give you such strong stabilization. And you see one level, I will show you two levels. This is exactly two minutes if you realize. And I am going for the other level. Of course, you will fix on both sides. You can put more than one screw. I call it double insurance screw or triple insurance screw. These are absolutely safe if you follow the angle properly. So first I made guide hole and then I introduced, this is completely an unedited tape after the exposure. And if you wait for 10 minutes, there will be five level fixation on both sides. So this is a beautiful technique without any question. There is, you know, you can use, these are 2.6 millimeter screw. About this one is 14 millimeter in length. And this creates such a solid fixation in the most solid part of the spine. This camillus technique fixation is an underused surgical technique in the field of spine. And those who are interested in spine, must do this method of fixation because this is the most beautiful method of fixation. Okay, so let me go further. Now, the next thing is, what are the indicators of spinal instability in degenerative spine? What, are, what indicates? Now, you see this carefully, this slide. These are osteophytes and OPLL kind of story here. And I have done four level fixation. Now you will ask me the problem is at two level. Why have you done four levels? So I have to tell you that there are many indicators of spinal instability. One is radiological indicator. One is clinical indicator. And one is intraoperative by you touch the, you touch the spinous process and you can feel the unstable spine. So intraoperative indicators. And you see, after one and a half year, the whole thing has gone. Can you see that, my friend? Yes, sir. So do you think it is magical? There is, I have not done any corpectomy. I have not done any discoidectomy. Everything is gone. Radiological magic is one thing, but clinical magic, our patients want clinical magic. And that you have to believe me, absolute magic in the immediate post-operative period. So you see there is multi-level compression. Everything is finished. I have not done any decompression, only transarticular fixation, no decompression. No, this is radiological magic. This is, you see this multi-segmental issue. This is after some time I have not, I have done transarticular fixation, no decompression. I use the spinous process and iliac crest bone to put here. Arthrodesis is the aim of the treatment. Now, another beautiful, I want my dear friends, please carefully listen to what I'm saying now. See, when we talk of spinal degeneration, when we talk of spinal spondylosis, we never talk of atlantoaxial instability. I have to tell you that multi-segmental spinal degeneration is almost always, now listen carefully, is almost always associated with atlantoaxial instability, which is central atlantoaxial instability. You see, there is multi-segmental. Can you see multi-segmental spinal compression? Can you see? 
Yeah. Yes, sir, perfectly. There is no compression here. You see, there is no compression. Can you see compression? There is no compression, right? Yeah, there is no, no compression. You see this facetal instability. Can you see facetal instability? Yes. yes, sir. So there is vertical spinal instability in the subaxial, vertical spinal instability in the subaxial cervical spine, and there is central instability in the atlantoaxial joint. There is no atlantodental interval disturbance, but you have to include atlantoaxial and subaxial only stabilization, no decompression. And believe me, my friends, magic is the result. And also I have to tell you that if you do not include atlantoaxial joint in your fixation construct, you may get a negative surgical outcome. So when the patient comes with severe myelopathy, when the patient comes with severe myelopathy, my feeling is atlantoaxial instability is almost always present. Can you see multi-segmental compression? Yes, sir. All, all due to vertical instability. These are secondary, these are protective, and these are reversible. And there is no compression here. You Can you see the facetal malalignment? You have to do atlantoaxial fixation and you have to see the magic. Another beautiful thing I'm saying, I'm saying even when there is no facetal malalignment in severe myelopathy, there is atlantoaxial instability and you have to do atlantoaxial stabilization. And you, I have got at least 20 patients in my own series, which may be corrected by my associate, at least 20 who had come on a stretcher and they are walking after surgery. Means not immediately after some time. So stretcher means you are not even walking. And patients who are severely disabled you have to do multi-segmental, include atlantoaxial joint. So because you are including multi-segments, people, you know, I have to now tell you that we have introduced a new technique of C1, C2 stabilization without C1 inclusion by cutting the muscles of C2 and C2-3 fixation. Now you see this one, there is smile instability, doubtful instability, but, and there is no compression. I have done C2-3 transarticular, and I have cut all the muscles of the C2 spinous process, and that gives you stabilization of atlantoaxial joint and subaxial stabilization, and you see the cord is back, and the patient is also back home. So multi-segmental, no compression. I have done C2-3. When there is no problem at C2-3, no problem at C1-2, I've done C1-2. So when to do, what to do are the issues. You have to understand the issue of stabilization. So similar concept we introduced for lumbar canal stenosis. We said, now carefully see, whole world will do decompression for lumbar degeneration. You agree, for, agree with me? Lumbar canal stenosis, you do laminectomy, yes? Yes. Whole world will do, not only you, but the whole world will do laminectomy. Now you read the title in Neurosurgical Focus. I am analyzing the role of stabilization and futility of decompression. I'm saying decompression is not good. It is futility of decompression. So this was published in Neurosurgical Focus. This kind of multiple compressions are not primary. Stenosis is not primary. These are secondary, these are protective, these are reversible, and you have to do only stabilization by transarticular fixation. And I have got several patients which I have treated like this, where there is no decompression and only fixation. And these are very heavily published in the literature I want you to please read these articles. Now my question before you is, and you answer my question. 
do you think you need to remove the osteophytes? Yes or no? Yes, sir. You want to remove the osteophytes? Yes. Yes. So, okay. So now you see, <laughs> I'm saying, is it necessary to resect osteophytes in degenerative cervical spondylotic myelopathy? My answer to that question is, osteophytes are secondary, osteophytes are protective, osteophytes are reversible. You do fixation, only fixation, and they disappear. There is no need to do discoidectomy, multi-segmental. If you have to do discoidectomy here in this person, you will have to do C34, C45, C56, and then you have to do what in this patient I would like to do is, I want to do atlantoaxial fixation, subaxial fixation. You see atlantoaxial fixation, subaxial fixation, and that, you know, I cannot show you the patients, but magic is the clinical outcome. So what happened, this is published in World Neurosurgery. I want you to read, you said yes, but now I want you to read this article. What happens to osteophytes when there is only fixation in multi-level spinal spondylosis? Uh, 12 month follow-up. So this is multi-segmental osteophytes. You see the osteophytes have disappeared and I have not done any kind of decompression, no anterior surgery, no posterior decompression, only fixation. <clears throat> you see multi-segmental this thing and I have, there is no compression left. I have not done any laminectomy or osteotech, osteophyte removal, which the whole world will do. I know it is controversial. I know it is difficult for you to accept, but please, we have to change. We have to, we don't have to follow what the whole world is doing and just go on saying, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, tell me yes or no. Will you want to remove the osteophytes? Yes or no? Say yes if you are not correct. <laughs> Don't worry. So is the term degenerative spinal stenosis a misnomer? I am saying yes. If there is stenosis, you want to do decompression. So I am saying stenosis is not a good term. It should, we should use multi-segmental instability. Stenosis means decompression. Instability means stabilization. Now I will give you another chapter. You see this kind of multi, this kind of kyphotic deformity. Yes. Many people in the world will like to do kyphectomy or corpectomy for this. You will like to do corpectomy, yes or no? Yes. So you should not do. In this patient, in this patient, there is atlantoaxial instability. You do only atlantoaxial stabilization. Okay. Now this patient. There is a kyphus here and there is multi-segmental compression. So this kyphotic deformity is an out is secondary, is protective, is reversible. You do only stabilization. There is no need to do any kind of decompression. So this is a kyphus here. You have to identify which levels are unstable. I want you to please read my article on this subject, which was published in World Neurosurgery, where I have mentioned that deformity is always secondary. Deformity is all like kyphosis, like kyphoscoliosis, like torticollis. They are secondary. They are protective and they are reversible. And they are due to unstable spine and stabilization is the treatment and decompression is not the treatment. So this kind of kyphotic deformity, you see this kind of osteophyte, there's no need to do all these kind of osteophyte removal and corpectomy. I have done only stabilization and a magical clinical outcome. Now I want to go to another controversial subject. And I know many of you are senior people, you have done hundreds of disc removal, hundreds and you know, you have used endoscope, you have done minimal invasive, you have, you know, all kinds of scopes for prolapsed disc. So I'm saying that prolapsed disc is an outcome of unstable spine. Instability results in prolapsed disc, or prolapse this results in unstable spine and only fixation is the treatment. Like if there is an acute disc, you like to give a collar, you like to give a lumbar belt, you want to stabilize. So what we can do is only stabilize the spine 
without doing any kind of discoidectomy. You see, there is one level disc herniation. This is the disc herniation. I am saying disc herniation is secondary, disc herniation is protective, and disc herniation is reversible. You do only fixation. You see the disc has gone, the disc has completely disappeared, and the patient will have such remarkable symptoms that you will never get by cervical discoidectomy, which the whole world is doing. I'm not saying you don't do, I am giving you my concepts. Whether you accept it or not accept it, that is on you. And some who have controversy or some kind of confusion, I will invite them to my department and we can, I can show you several of these cases and I will 100% make you do what I'm doing, 100%. So this was my article which was published in World Neurosurgery, Facetal Fixation Arthrodesis as a treatment of cervical radiculopathy. Now I am giving you another very controversial thing, lumbar radiculopathy. And this was also published in Journal of Craniovertebral Junction and Spine. This kind of disc herniation, the whole world without a single person will come using endoscope or minimal invasive or micro discectomy and remove the disc. And I was doing this kind of procedure for years. But I am now saying you do only fixation and see after six months this disc disappears and there is no decompression and no discoidectomy. And I have got several patients like this now in my series where their disc was not removed, only fixation and not a single complication. You must read my articles on this subject. And this is very heavily published in the literature. Idiopathic lumbar scoliosis, which occurs in old age. And I had, this patient is a very high profile person, a president of one another country. He's, the, he's now retired as president, but this was the president of a country who I treated. And I know Mehmet Zeleli knows about this patient. And this patient has idiopathic scoliosis and I did only fixation without any kind of decompression and remarkable recovery in the symptoms. This is also an idiopathic scoliosis, only fixation. If you read the literature, the whole world will do various kinds of decompression for this problem. Now I give you another beautiful, now my dear friends, just fasten your seat belts. Have you fastened your seat belt, my dear friend? Yes. <laughs> okay. Always. So ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament. Ossification. Now you see this ossification of ligament can be of various types. And I have been treating and my article, this was oblique corpectomy was the first time in the literature I said, you must do oblique corpectomy. Many people do oblique corpectomy, but they don't refer to my article. This was the first time in the literature I said oblique corpectomy, but, and this was the, you see, I did oblique corpectomy and no fixation. But now what I'm saying is that OPLL is not primary. OPLL is secondary. OPLL is protecting. OPLL is reversible. And you have to do only stabilization and this was also published in World Neurosurgery. Only stabilization, the ideal treatment of OPLL. And more recently, I published my series of 52 cases of OPLL treated by only fixation. Now, this kind of OPLL, what will you do, my friend? Tell me. The compression problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So no, you see, you have to, you, if you have to do decompression, you have to do corpectomy here or laminectomy here or laminoplasty here. I am saying do only fixation and see the magic, a magic which you have never seen by decompression. In OPLL, atlantoaxial instability can be present in a number of cases, and that instability is a central instability. You see that is instability here, OPLL, no decompression, atlantoaxial and subaxial stabilization. 
high OPLL, multi-segmental, no decompression, only stabilization. There is no compression here, but there is central instability. I have introduced atlantoaxial stabilization. You see multi-segmental OPLL, there is no decompression and only stabilization. <clears throat> you see here, there is multi-segmental only stabilization. And I want you to please, you know, you are young, particularly, I don't know your name properly, my friend, Dr. Vasvi, right? Yes, Edwin. Yes, Edwin. From Bulgaria. So Ed, Edwin, you are a young, young doctor. You must read my articles and you should keep your mind open. You should keep your mind supple. You should not be fixed. Yeah, decompression, decompression, osteophyte, osteophyte. You remove, but you keep your mind open. So atlantoaxial and subaxial cervical fixation, can it revolutionize the treatment of OPLL? I am saying yes. And I'm saying absolutely yes. So Camille's technique of fixation, I introduced double insurance, two screws. I introduced three screws. You see three screws in one lumbar facet. So like the facet, I do it for C1, C2, which many of you know about my technique. And many of you in Turkey use my technique of fixation, of atlantoaxial fixation, which fixes the facet, which is a very strong technique of fixation. So, can decompressive laminectomy for degenerative spondylotic lumbar and cervical spine stenosis become historical? You see, laminectomy is still the gold standard treatment. Decompression is still the gold standard treatment. Can it become historical? Is instability the nodal point of pathogenesis of both spondylosis and OPLL? My answer is yes. So like transoral surgery, like foramen magnum decompression surgery, can anterior cervical surgery become fine space in history book? So you have to answer that question. Can this kind of laminectomy, can this kind of corpectomy, can anterior surgery become historical? I'm saying yes. I'm saying yes, whether you agree or whether you don't agree, whether you accept or whether you don't accept. But this is heavily in literature published and you think about it. So from only decompression to only fixation, this is the century long journey of spinal spondylosis. So atlantoaxial and subaxial spinal fixation, can it revolutionize the treatment of cervical myelopathy related to OPLL? My answer to that question is yes, and absolutely yes. So my, I, my dear friends, I'm introducing a new concept before you. Compression is never primary and decompression is never the treatment. So this is one card which one of my patients had sent to me from Canada and she has sent thank you to me. And I say, my dear friends, thank you for inviting me for this lecture. And I hope I have put your mind into a troubled kind of situation and you have enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much, my dear friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank sir. you, Edwin, for for uh, giving me some nice answers during my lecture. <laughs> it was honest. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to open for discussion. I know there will be several questions. I have no doubt there will be several questions, but before I start taking questions, before I start answering questions, I want, you see, whatever I have said is very heavily published in the topmost journals of the world. So if you have questions, you can ask me, of course. But if you have very intricate question and you are interested in this, I want you to read my articles and get that sorted out. And if you are still not having the answer, you can personally write to me and I will be happy to answer all your questions. Thank you, sir. Um, it was really an honor, honor to listen to you. In my eyes, you are one of the most influential neurosurgeons in the world. Thank you very much. Thank Before you. starting to ask questions from the audience, I, I would like to ask the first question. 
I was going to ask question for uh, degenerative cervical cervical myopathy, but uh, you give me you gave me all the answers. So I would like to ask about one of my patients, uh, which I operated one month ago. The patient had a uh, very big osteophyte in L1, L2 with recess, uh, uh, foramen stenosis. The patient was crying from uh, radiculopathy pain. So uh, I did the decompression. We did the uh, tea leaf surgery and, and the, pa the patient postoperatively was perfectly. She had no pain at all. So sir, you are saying us, do not do the compression if the patient is crying from pain. Do the fixation and to wait the osteophyte to uh, go away. Are you saying this, sir? No, listen to my listen to this. I want to answer it properly. When there is an acute disc herniation, acute disc herniation, what do you suggest to the patient? You wear a collar, right? You say, tell them you wear a collar or you wear a lumbar belt, even if he's so. And if the patient and the person, if he keep the neck straight, the pain goes, you see, and many of these patients are treated conservatively. Now I'm saying, when you use a collar, means you are trying to stabilize the neck. So this fixation, I have got several patients in my series who have come from all over the world with severe pain. And I have done only fixation without removing the osteophyte and without removing the disc, even large soft disc. You are talking of osteophyte. Osteophyte is a chronic process. Osteophyte is not an acute process. Soft disc is an acute process. Even soft disc, I am saying that you can do just fixation, transarticular fixation, straight and simple and quick operation, and you can avoid discoidectomy. You see, discoidectomy, if you come from front, you involve the disc, you want to remove, you want to go near the root. It is a, everybody in the world is doing. And it is a simple operation, but you do only fixation one level and you see the magic, a magic which you have never realized in your lifetime in treating discoidectomy. So this is my answer. You read about my article on this subject. Okay, Edwin? Yes, I will read them. Okay. Um, I will convey all the questions and comments to you in accordance with the format of Izmir Online Neurosurgery meetings. So I will, I will start with the first question from Mehmet Ali Demir. He says, hello, Mr. Goel. Thank you for the incredible, inspiring talk. I wonder, how you can be sure and operate case, cases who have not any radiological evidence. Thanks. Now I will say, you see, like Chiari malformation. I do only fixation in majority of chronic, in majority of Chiari malformation, you cannot demonstrate instability. My understanding is absolutely clear. And my understanding is absolutely clear on the basis of a very large number of patients. Chiari malformation is a secondary phenomena due to chronic atlantoaxial instability. Only fixation is the treatment. If you do decompression, which I was doing, I mentioned in my article, in my presentation, that concept of tight posterior fossa was introduced by us. Concept of decompression for carry was introduced by us. I am saying that decompression for carry is now a negative treatment. Carry malformation patient comes with pain in the neck, then tingling in the hands, then wasting in the hands, then walking disability, then breathing disability, then sleep apneas, then pain on coughing, all these symptoms will disappear in the initial postoperative period following atlantoaxial fixation. The problem is, the problem is in the presence of carry, in the presence of syringomyelia, to do atlantoaxial fixation is not an easy surgical operation. To decompression is a very easy operation. You just take an incision and do mm, decompression. Fixation is difficult, but that is the treatment. 
Same thing is in degenerative spine. Decompression laminectomy is a, you ask your resident to do decompression. You ask your junior most person to do decompressive laminectomy. But decompression, I am, my concept is absolutely clear. You identify which level is unstable. You must read my article on which, what are the indicators of spinal instability. Just radiological presence of osteophyte is not just one indicator. Symptoms are indicator. Intraoperative manipulation of bone is an indicator. So you identify the unstable segment and stabilize. How to identify an unstable segment? You have to learn, you have to understand. And if you are interested, I wish you read my article. And if you are more interested, please come to Mumbai and we will, I will show you several patients. And then you realize in science, you know what, in, in neurosurgery, in spinal surgery, there is no place for arbitrariness. Yeah, yeah, I don't agree and I don't agree. Are what you don't agree? If you don't agree, you come, either you read the articles or you listen. And if you are not agreeing, it is possible. I'm not saying it is not possible. Take a flight to Mumbai. I'm having two or three Turkish young boys who are coming to me next month. And uh, you know, these Turkish boys, I will make them give a lecture in front of your organization. Okay, Edwin, these two or three Turkish boys are coming to me next month. And the, one of them is sitting in the audience. So oh. this Turkish boy will report to you my ex his experience when he comes back. And then you will be able to accept this concept better. Okay? Thank you, sir. Another question from Professor Uyghur R. He says, Dear Goyal, thanks for the tremendous presentation. I am one of the four of this concept. Is it suitable to the compress after stabilization is achieved or is it completely useless? So my answer is in very honest, very honest. You see today, I must tell you Edwin, I am giving this lecture very, you know, happy. And, you know, you, Hassan told me you can take as much time as you want. So I am talking slowly. So my honest answer is decompression is completely useless. No need to do decompression. No, no need. This is my answer. You do stabilization, no need for decompression. Thank you, sir. Another question from Mehmet Ali Demir. He says, I I want to ask if primary cause is atlanto axial instability and all of these are secondary, how the compression techniques are sometimes useful clinically for secondary pathologies. I accept majority of cases are not satisfactory. You know what I am, you know what is the major operation these days I am doing one of the most major operations I, I get from all over the place is foramen magnum decompression has been done already and failed foramen magnum decompression. If you do foramen magnum decompression and if the operation has failed and the patient continues to have symptoms, then what you do? So these kind of patients, I'm getting many. I know, you know, this question has been asked to me by many people as to these, sometimes the results are good. So why the results are good? Like even you said to me, discoidectomy, I did the results are good. So discoidectomy is a different issue, foramen magnum decompression. You see, I, you know, as I mentioned to you, decompression is an operation which we describe. Decompression, when you take an incision in the neck and you do muscle retraction and you do put some, you know, some blood goes here and there in the joint. My feeling is that may be stabilizing. When you do incision, the neck may be stable and the patient may be improving for some time. But my feeling is if you ask 100 patients how much you have improved following surgery, at least 60 or 70 will say that they have not had any improvement and they continue to worsen. But you know what? Over the period of time, they stabilize their neck and they don't move their neck because of the pain that they get due to incision. And sometimes there may be spontaneous fusion. That may be the outcome. But you please 
Don't keep this confusion in your mind. Gyari malformation is a result of Atlanto axial instability. I know one paper from Turkey I read. I think, uh, you know, I couldn't read that name, but uh, you could, did you write that article, uh, article from Turkey? They wrote that Atlanto axial fixation, they agree and they do from Turkey. So I, you can ask your, uh, you know, I don't know who wrote that article. I don't remember his name, but from Turkey. And I have no hesitation to tell my, all my people who are listening to me today, Atlanto actual instability is the cause of carry malformation, seringomyelia, basilar invagination, bifid, T, C1 bifid, C2 bifid, platybasia, short neck, seringomyelia, Hirayama disease, spinal spondylosis in many of the cases, cervical OPLL in many cases, you do Atlanto axial stabilization. So first sentence, if you remember, I said in my lecture <clears throat> that Atlanto axial instability is the most misunderstood undertreated clinical entity in spine. No decompression is re required. Only stabilization is required. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Ismail Kaya. He says, thank you for your valuable contribution to the literature. I have two questions, but I see three questions. So I will ask them one by one. First question is, do you use disk spaces, spacers maybe he wanted to say, in patients with neurological deficits? Yes, of course. Of course, neurological symptoms and neurological deficits in radiculopathy, in myelopathy, in single level, in multiple level. You see, there can be single level disc, multi-level disc. But as I mentioned in my lecture, as I mentioned, I was using intra-articular spaces, which we described, which I described long time ago. But nowadays, I don't use spacers too often. I use transarticular camillus technique of fixation. Instability is the problem. Stabilization is the treatment. And another question from Dr. Ismail Kaya. Do disc spacers flatten in cerv cervical overdoses? No. You see, this kind of this question was asked to me on several occasions, like you introduce spacers, there can be a kyphotic deformity. You can into, they can be kyphotic. So my answer to that question is, you introduce spacers, it reverses, like basilar invagination. I describe basilar invagination. You distract, it comes back to normal. Similarly, when there is a listhesis, you, you make it back to normal. So it does not reduce the disk space. It increases the disk space. It increases the foraminal height. It increases the interspinous process height. So it is a, but as I mentioned nowadays, I don't even use indirect decompression. I use only stabilized. Another question from Ismail Kaya. Another question by. What yeah. do you think about dynamic stabilization systems? Maybe good. I don't know about this. I don't know about dynamic stabilization, but my my answer is stabilization. If you can introduce dynamic, I have actually, you know what? I will tell you recently I published one article which you can read in craniovertebral junction and spine. I have introduced artificial C1, C2 and subaxial joints. I have and that is patent to that is under my patent. And that is patented in India and also in United States. I have introduced a ball and socket joint in the facetal articulation. And that is, you know, it, that is a dynamic stabilization. And you can read my article, recent publication in Journal of uh, Craniovertebral Junction and Spine, dynamic stabilization in the facetal articulation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mehmet Ali Demir, he says, thank you, Mr. Go, for forget all you know presentation. <laughs> the last <Is> that? question, <laughs> okay. he says, forget all you know presentation. <laughs> the last question for cervical stenosis. Unbelievable results radiologically widen cervical canal without decompression. 
do you advise your patients any rehabilitation program post-op, anything like that to have these results? No, there is, you know, there will be rehabilitation all right for every patient. But I have to only tell you, and you have to, from my heart, I'm saying, from my heart, and to my Turkish and other people, even this, uh, you know, to Edwin, from my heart, I'm saying, this kind of improvement, this kind of magical improvement you have never seen in your decompression and discoidectomy and corpectomy in your lifetime. You have never seen. <clears throat> you have never seen. So you have to enjoy this. And there will be no need for rehabilitation. You, you They improve quite dramatically. Thank you. There is a question from Bernard. Uh, can lateral uh, mass screw achieve such excellent result instead of transarticular screws? I think they can. Lateral mass screws can, you know, I'm happy to hear from Bernard. Bernard, can you show yourself on the screen? I will be happy to see you. Even Dr. Wagner, who had written one article on degenerative spine, he's also asking some, can you show uh, Edwin? Okay. I, I I turn on his microphone. Hello, Bernard. Hey. Hello, sir. Hello. <laughs> you are young boy. Oh, yeah. I thought you I'm were from uh, Tamil Nadu, sir. I'm from India. You are from? Tamil Nadu, Nadu. India, Very India. Good. Okay. From India. So what was your question? Uh, I didn't I was get just your question. asking whether the lateral mass screws will uh, have the same results as a, as that of a transarticular okay. screws with anterior cervical you see trans transarticular screws and lateral mass screws are both, both <laughs> strong i don't like pedicular screws you see some uh, some cross noise is coming edwin can you uh... Uh, bernard there is noise coming from yeah yeah, yeah. i I'll, I'll look up that yes thank you yeah. so there is a uh, you know Pedicular screws are good, vertebral body screws are good, but nothing like facetal screws. You can use facetal screws, but transarticular screw is such a simple procedure. I think you must try transarticular. It gives beautiful fixation and you can avoid the use of rods. When you're using transarticular, there is no need for rods. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can. Uh, please, Hassan Suju, Professor. Yes, thank you, Bernard, for muting. And uh, there is another question from Dia Yahya. He has a um, question which is similar to my question. How can osteophyte be reversible? Isn't it bony structure? No, it is reversible. You see, I have shown so many images. You must read my article. And... Uh, I have told you, osteophytes are not primary, osteophytes are secondary, they are protective, they are reversible. And you do this and you see the magic that is reversible. And there are several, several cases. So there is no question, no doubt about this. They are not, they are bony, but they are reversible. Thank you, sir. There is another question from Dia Yahya. How to decide precisely if this kyphosis is due to instability in C1, C2 articulation. See, C1, C2 articulation causes several secondary effects. Chronic instability causes several secondary features on the spine and kyphotic torticollis are some of those features. And there are all these secondary, you see when there is an acute injury, there is a spastic, the neck become, the muscles become strong and the spastic. But in chronic situation, it, there is a possibility of kyphotic deformity, scoliotic deformity, torticollis, and all those things. They are always, you identify C1, C2 instability, do C1, C2 stabilization. There's no need to do anything to the subaxial spine. If you want to know more details about what I do for kyphotic deformities, you must read my article, which was published in World Neurosurgery. Thank you, sir. Uh, before going to the next question, I would like to invite all participants, please add your name and university to your questions. Thank you. And um, country, of course. Yes, country, please. And from Kay Wagner, his question is, how long does it take for patients to improve from, from myopathy 
when you stabilize and only and do not decompress. Now, Dr. Wagner is the same Wagner who wrote this article on Chiari malformation. Say, are you there, Dr. Wagner? And which country you are from? Dr. Wagner, are you here? Dr. Wagner? Um, I... You can open your camera, Dr. Wagner. Please. Uh, he left probably, he is not here. Yeah. Not yet. Okay, so go to the next question then. Okay. Uh, okay, I am here. He said I am here and I cannot unmute. Uh, just uh, yes. open your camera. I will unmute yes. you. Yes. Uh, because I cannot see you. Open your camera, please. Dr. Wagner. Dr. Wagner is here. He writes. Where is oh, he? He's here. Okay, let him come. We'll talk to him later so let him first come in the meantime you go to the next question okay uh, question from abdul rahim tash thank you very much sir go for the wonderful presentation and thank you, uh, abdul. contribution sai ikan kiran how about adjacent segment degeneration in this fixation cases sir that is also one beautiful question first i want to thank my dear friend abdul rahim and he was one who had joined me in my center. And I had such a wonderful boy, Abdul Rahim, not boy, he's of course a senior neurosurgeon, but he had spent some time and I'm happy, having very happy memories of his day with me. Now, as regards Sai Kiran's question about adjacent segment. So now here it is very important. You see, I told you there are ways to identify unstable segments. We only see the radiology. We see osteophytes and we see the disc herniation or we see the ligamentum flavum protrusion, uh, protrusion and we say that these are unstable segments. But that is not the only. You can go adjoining segment and you mobile, move the spinous process. And if they are unstable, you will identify. So you can avoid unstable adjacent segment instability by stabilizing the unstable segment in the first operation. So if you are going anterior cervical and doing anterior surgery, you may not stabilize the other adjacent segments. But if you do posterior and just move the spinous process, you can identify the unstable segments and stabilize at the same time, and you can avoid adjacent segment degeneration. Okay, Dr. Goel, uh, Dr. Wagner, turn on his camera and I will... Okay, Dr. Wagner, you can turn on your microphone. Oh, great. How can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. So I did not write that Chiari um, article, unfortunately. Okay. I just graduated from <laughs> Stanford's um, Spine uh, Fellowship in Neurosurgery. And I was wondering, um, you know, if you do these surgeries with just the fixation, and Dr. John Park takes a similar approach for some of these with different hardware, but um, how long does it take before you see the patients getting better? Uh, from their myelopathy? And does it happen quickly? Because I realize if there's still bony compression, those neural elements are still um, squished. Sorry, Dr. Uh, Wagner, where I... are you from? First of all, which country? Where are you from? Uh, unmute, please. Yes. So I'm in California in the United okay. States. Um, I'm no. in private practice now, or I will be starting my private practice job in about three weeks. Sorry wants to say hi. And um, I just graduated now, from me, um, Spine Fellowship in California, USA. Now, let me answer that question. And I will answer the question. And you have to just believe what I'm saying. You do fixation, and you see the magic. You see a magic, which you have never realized. And you think compression is the problem, compression is the problem, and compression I am saying compression is not the problem. Instability is the problem. You stabilize and compression will not be the problem anymore. Compression will reverse. That is the key sentence of my entire presentation. Compression is not primary. Compression is not a pathology. Compression is protective and compression is reversible. Decompression is not the treatment. Decompression is eventually harmful. St instability is the issue. Stabilization is the treatment. 
and magic is the clinical outcome in the evening of operation after reversal of anesthesia. So you try this. Thank you, sir. And there is a question from Murat Doshow. What can you say for symptomatic pure ossified anterior longitudinal, longitudinal ligaments? Same etiology, axial instability, and the recommendation, please. Thank you. Only stabilization is the treatment for OPLL. There is no need to remove the OPLL. There is no need to do any kind of decompression. OPLL is also secondary and it should not be touched. You do OPLL surgery, you can create harm. You can create significant, is a dangerous operation. You do multiple corpectomy, you can create hemiplegia, you can create quadriplegia. You do this simple operation, it is a quick operation and an absolutely philosophical concept. Thank you, sir. And there is a question which is directed to me. Uh, probably you do not see it, Professor Goyle. It is from Khalifa Adel. Uh, he uh, or she, thank you for this inspiring presentation full of revolutionary ideas. First question is, the concept of secondary, it is clear, but protective is still confusing. Please, how can com compressive disc or panels be protective? See, like, like I said, you know, all these sentences are all published. When I say Chiari tonsillar herniation is protective. It is secondary, it is protective. When I say syringomyelia is secondary and it is protective. When I say basal invagination is secondary, it is protective. When I say clipal file abnormality, platybasia are secondary and protective. You do fixation, they reverse. Similarly, when there is a disc herniation or when there is an osteophyte formation, they are indicators of chronic process. You see, in acute, it will not happen. In chronic process, you will have slowly, slowly osteophyte will go on increasing, increasing, increasing. They are attempts of nature to stabilize artificially. Nature is trying to stabilize. Nature is trying its best to stabilize by introducing bone in the region of the joint. And if you do not do anything, eventually you will see the even vertebral bodies fusing. Even the disc space goes on reducing, 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 and there will be fusion. If you do not treat anything, ultimately it will fuse. So there are nature's protective processes and they are nature's process. Like if there is an acoustic tumor, there is hydrosphalus. Hydrosphalus is a secondary natural protection. When there is colloidosis, there is ventricular enlargement. These are protective, these are secondary. When there is aneurysmal bleed, there, there is vasospasm. Vasospasm is not primary, it is protective. So we have to understand nature. We have to understand the laws of nature, how nature protects. We have to understand what is primary, what is secondary, and what needs treatment, and what needs reverence. Means you have to thank God there is an osteophyte. Thank God there is OPL. So we have to have reverence for nature and nature is too big, too big. Uh, Professor Goyal, uh, Dr. Bernard asked for your email. Can I write down to, for everyone? <laughs> Please write down. Okay. And another question from Khalifa Adel, which is again directed to me. Probably you, you do not see it. It is for basilar invagination. You said you still use spacer basing on the concept of secondary protective and reversible. How can we decide if this patient needs spacer or only stabilization? Now, I have to tell you that I described spacers in the year 2000, 22 years ago, I described spacers for the first time in the literature. And I use spacers for a long time, but now I'm saying, today I'm saying, instability is the cause Stabilization is the treatment. Instead of spacers nowadays, I open the joint, denude the articular cartilage, introduce bone graft in the joint space, and then do fixation. 
my indication of spacers has reduced quite remarkably. I use spacers only when they, I feel that I need additional stabilization of the joint. So stabilization is the treatment, instability is the cause of basal invagination. Thank you, sir. There is a question from Dia Yahya again. Is there any reason for doc Dr. Guel to leave interarticular spacers and use Camille technique instead? Which technique? Camille, Camille. Roy Camille. Roy Camille technique. Roy Roy Camille technique. No, unfortunately, I don't know this what technique you have. You know, no, Roy you Camille, can... transarticular technique. Yeah, transarticular. Yes, trans yes. Trans Camille yeah. technique. Roy Camille. Camille, huh? Camille is Camille technique. technique. Yeah, of yes. course, of course. Camille is technique. Camille is technique is fantastic. You know this uh, subaxial, uh, subaxial spine. This technique has some kind of unique magic in this. You see, we do all. We have done pedicular fixation, this fixation all our life. But this Camille is technique is a magic, magic. Uh, there is a contribution from Kip or up for C1 C2 instability. Does addition of occipital fusion add to stability or correcting secondary pathology pathologies? So he's asking, do we need to include occipital fusion? You do not need occipital fusion in craniovertebral junction instability. Occipital fusion is not necessary. I have to tell you that occipital screws that you put, occipital screws were first described by me, occipital screws. I described occipital screws in 1987. About 34, 35 years ago, I described occipital screws. First time in the literature. Now I'm saying occipital fixation, craniovertebral junction instability means atlantoaxial instability. Craniovertebral junction stabilization means atlantoaxial stabilization. Occipital fusion is rarely, occipital atlantal instability is extremely rare. And very rarely it is required in high degree of trauma in some syndromic children. Otherwise, occipital C1 is almost never necessary. Thank you, sir. There is a comment from Erhamid Akutan, which is, in my opinion, unique. He says, thank you, Mr. Goel, for this presentation, which is devastating for current literature. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I want, you know what? I don't want to, I want you to think about it. I want you to, you know, many people now in the world are doing what I'm saying. It is not that only I'm saying, many people have followed it and many people write to me. And I want you to think about it and then go further. And I want not to be devastation. <laughs> I want to be pushing the literature. I want to help the literature, not de <laughs> devastate the liter literature. Uh, sorry, Edwin. There is mm -hmm. a thanks uh, from uh, Catherine Wagner from California, but she wrote to me uh, personally <laughs> by mistake, I think. She says, thank you, Dr. Goel. Great to hear from you. Dr. Catherine Wagner, California, USA. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. And from Amar, thank you for presentation, but I want to ask when you use transarticular fixation and when you use uh, muscle lateralis fixation in cervical myopathy? I nowadays, I always use transarticular fixation, always. I Thank used you. to do lateral mass fixation. I used to do pedicular fixation. I used to do all kinds of fixation. I also, you know, used to do midline fixation. I also used to do laminoplasty, but I have stopped all those. I like transarticular, very quick, very fast, very strong, and very effective and very safe. Thank you, sir. And from Dr. Abdul Rahim Tash. On his question is on, on average, how long does it take for posterior ligament hypertrophy to regress after posterior stabilization? See, I have, I'm still analyzing OPLL, posterior longitudinal ligament, how much time it takes. I think the osteophytes disappear much quickly. 
but OPLL disappears, the time of disappearance is not so, I'm not yet, I cannot answer that question, but what happens is the posterior longitudinal ligament becomes, you know, instead of bony, it becomes soft with the period of time. But I will give you this answer after about two years, Abdul Rahim. Okay, after two years, because I, my work is still going on on this subject. Thank you, sir. And Tahashikru Korkmas, uh, his question is a, a little bit similar like my question. He says, if the patient has extruded this herniation and has severe extremity pain, extremity pain, do you see a decrease in pain in the first hours after surgery when you perform stabilization instead of discectomy? Yes, not first hour. As soon as the person awakes from anesthesia, the pain is gone, as soon. And that pain will never recur if you have done a solid, beautiful fixation. Thank you. In 100% of patients, not in 10% or 80% or 90%, you do a solid fixation and pain is gone. You try it, you try it. You know what, some people will say, no, I don't agree, I don't believe. You see, you do PLIF operation for lumbar disc, right? PLIF, that is also fixation. Yes. So you are removing the disc. You are for cervical, you do ACDF. That is also fixation, anterior cervical decompression and fixation. So instead you do only fixation and the midline is open for you, anterior neck is open for you. Suppose the patient does not improve in two days, you can come from front and do the, just do, remove the discard. Uh, you don't need to even fix because you have already fixed. I have never required fixation after decompression. Never after fixation. I have never required decompression. Never. You have to either say, I believe you, or you say, I don't believe in you. But this is all in the literature. All this is very heavily published in very big journals. So you have to read. And I have already given you an invitation for those who are really interested, may like to come and visit me and enjoy my hospitality. I know Turkish hospitality is very good. I know I have enjoyed my visits to various, you know, cities of your country. And I know the beautiful food that I enjoy. And, uh, but I don't want to come because your food is very, it makes me fat in 10 days. I become double my size. So I have to be very careful because I love your food so much. I eat too much, but I enjoy your country. I will certainly come to Izmir or to any other city you okay. invite me. I will, it will be my pleasure to come. I, I can show you around, Dr. Gura. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, there is contribution from Dia Yahya from Turkey. I want to thank Dr. Goyal for his great talk and I wish to join him in his clinic in the future. He's my idol, he says. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you are most welcome. From uh, Erhamit Okutan, there is contribution and question. When we think about the medical knowledge situation, especially in our country. If the patient has neurological deficit after the surgery, he, she may sue us. In your technique, when you apply the stabilization materials to cervical spine, especially who has severe spinal stenosis and myopathy, that seems it can cause spinal cord injury. Have you ever experienced this kind of bottleneck during this period of this novel technique. And See, one, thing, there... one, one thing I can tell you, all spine operations, everything can cause complications. Every operation can have any, you remove a glioma, you can create hemiplegia. You remove a hematoma, you can create a problem. So our field, our neurosurgery and our spine surgery and our uh, spinal surgery are, are difficult, dangerous operations. But you know, when you're doing Camillus technique, transarticular, it is away from the neural structures. It is absolutely safe. You know, you're not putting the screw anywhere near the nerve root, anywhere near the cord. And you are doing lateral fixation away from the cord. Like when you're doing C1, C2 fixation, it is away from the neural structures, fascial fixation. So this fixation is away and absolutely safe. And if you do fixation, suppose your patient does not improve. 
after 10 days, 15 days, you find the patient say, oh, my hand is still paining, my leg is paining, my weakness is still there. You can come and do anterior surgery. You can do midline decompression anytime. But I have told you, for last 15 years, I'm doing this. I've never done decompression after my fixation. And these are all in literature. You can read my publications, which are all there in the literature. <clears throat> so it can happen. You know, I'm not saying nothing can happen and fixation can, how can a lateral fixation cause spinal cord injury when we have not even opened the spinal canal, when we have not even done any laminectomy, when we have not done any kind of manipulation of the cord. So lateral fixation is absolutely safe. It is very strong and it is very stable. Thank you, sir. And uh, there is a question from Murat Doshaw. Uh, he says, my question was related to ossification of anterior ligament, forestier disease, which, which is causing dysphagia or dysphonia, not OPLL. Thanks again, he says. See, anterior, this anterior uh, osteophytes, which can cause dysphagia and spinal cord, they are also evidences of unstable spine. You go and remove the, you know, osteophyte, which is causing, which is going into the esophagus. You can damage the esophagus. My answer is very straightforward. You do fixation and see the magic. You see the result. You may not need to remove that osteophyte because you come and remove the osteophyte in, you know, uh, which is embedding into the esophagus. You can damage and you can create severe problem. If you read the literature, anterior fixation, anterior corpectomy, anterior decompression, two level, three level, you read, uh, you read the topmost literature, there are at least 20% complication rate, 20%, 15%, 30%. And I, I don't want to name that article written by the topmost spine surgeon, 35% complication rate after three or four level anterior surgery. I am saying there is zero, zero complication. So, whether, whether I'm saying wrong, that is a possibility. But I'm saying that this lateral fixation, there is no question of any, you see, it is such lateral, it is such safe, and it is absolutely fantastic. You try this. Don't be hesitant in trying. This is my recommendation to you. Thank you, sir. And Amar has another question. Thank you for this presentation, but I want to ask, when you use transarticular fixation and when you do you use massa lateralis fixation in cervical myopathy? I think that Professor Go said that he's using only transarticular fixation. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. And uh, Wow Rehman, he says, Dear sir, Ato Go, please, I need your cell, not email. If uh, Professor Go wants, maybe you can email him. He has your cell number. <laughs> okay. I, I, I wrote down uh, Professor Atulgoyer's email and then he uh, write, he can write to Atulgoyer and ask his phone number. Yes. Personally. And uh, Dia Yahya says, thank you. Bernard says, thank you. Sai Kiran, will you advise fixation for laminectomy done? for spinal tumor excision, sir. Uh, we do not hear you, sir, so, Professor Go. your voice has gone. No voice. <laughs> no. No? No, no, we hear oh, okay. you. Okay. Hello? Yes, we here, sir, perfect. So laminectomy and tumor, you see tumor is a, you know, when you do laminectomy only, I don't think there is fixation necessary, but uh, if you do a wide laminectomy, you are affecting the facets because I have said that facets are very important. And if you are disrupting the facets, you might make uh, the spine unstable and then there can be a chronic instability and then can be chronic deformity, it is better to stabilize the segments. This is my answer. Thank you, sir. And uh, there is contribution from Kiprop Negetic, neurosurgery resident from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you for insightful presentation and 
question, question well answered on occipital cervical fusion. Uh, there is contribution from Bernard. It was mind boggling to listen to you, Professor Goel. Thank you for the fantastic lecture. Thank and you very much for another. listening and thank you everybody. And I hope you enjoyed it. There and is I one more question. Oh, too bad. One okay. more question, yes, <laughs> from Volkan. Thank you very much, sir, for such a legendary presentation. I was wondering when or how did you realize that atlantoaxial instability is the uh, main cause of many secondary protective conditions just because it's the most mobile segment? Yes, you are correct, Volkan. It is a uh, most mobile. You see, when there is more mobility, there is a potential for more instability. More the mobility, more the instability. Like for brain, you see glial cells are more multiplying cells. Neuronal cells are less multiplying cells. More the multiplication, more the possibility of abnormal multiplication. That is why you see gliomas in the brain. How many neuronal tumors you are seeing? You are seeing very few. So more the multiplication, more the possibility of abnormal multiplication, more the mobility. Atlantoaxial joint is the most mobile joint. It is round joint. It is completely round and it is completely flat. That is why there is circumferential movements. And there, when there are circumferential movements, there is a possibility of circumferential instability. Nobody in the world has ever talked about circumferential instability. Central instability is the issue. And central instability leads to so many pathological things which nobody has ever treated. So there is a possibility to give magic, to give a beautiful outcome to our patient if you realize this concept. Welcome. Thank you, sir. There is one more contribution from Mohammed Adnan. He says, thank you so much, sir. Thank okay. you, Mohammed. Thank you. I see that questions has ended. And uh, I will give now the word to our professor. And there is one more contribution from Siddharth Gautam. Thank you, sir, for giving to the point scientific basis to the surgical procedures. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth, for watching. Yeah. Volkan is saying thank you so much, sir. Now I want to give the word to our professor, Hassan Kamil Sujo. I want to thank Professor Atuguel one more time. He spoke you, in our Izmir Online Neurosurgery almost one year ago. It was an exceptional lecture. And today, again, we uh, we have Atuguel. Uh, it's, this is a wonderful lecture, again, as always. And we want to see Atuguel in Izmir uh, as soon as possible. And, Ertan Sevin will make a fish on the grill and we will eat <laughs> with some uh, Turkish rakı. <laughs> and I want to see you in here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you for your invitation. It was my pleasure. It was my honor. And I hope I could change a little bit of concepts of spine. And I hope and wish that they are important. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Okay. And there is one uh, more quest uh, from Bernard. Uh, he is writing to us for our organizers. Please make it available in YouTube. Sure, we will, it. but not immediately, sometimes later, because we, want, uh, we don't want to make the contribution lesser, less <laughs> and we will upload some time later, one month. Okay. Thank you for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye -bye. Thank you bye -bye. for joining everyone. Thank bye -bye. you. Good night. Good night.